Welcome to this Information Services Today webinar on today's information professions. This webinar addresses content from part two, Information Professions, specifically focusing on chapters six, seven, eight, and nine. This webinar is part of a 10 webinar series representing the diverse authors and topics of the second edition of my book, Information Services Today, and Introduction. As the editor, I am thrilled to be presenting this webinar series in conjunction with my textbook, Information Services Today and Introduction. Hearing directly from the contributing authors as they reflect and share their insight on today's information landscape is a unique opportunity to glean from their ex experience, uh, glean from their experience both the opportunities and challenges that lie on the horizon. In his article, From Community to Technology and Back Again, Havens states that libraries have been and still are centers of knowledge and resources for tens of thousands of communities. They are the hubs across which networks of learning connect millions of users and all kinds of scholarly activities. Part two, Information Professions, explores the changes in specific information environments, including those that serve students through school and academic libraries, members of the community through public libraries, and clients through special libraries and information centers. Chapters six through nine address both the similarities and uniqueness of the different types of information organizations where imp information professionals work, including school libraries in chapter six, academic libraries in chapter seven, public libraries in chapter eight, and special libraries in chapter nine. Each chapter highlights the organization's environment, including their physical and virtual spaces and the diverse and unique communities they serve. Each chapter also addresses the specific competencies needed for successfully meeting the needs of its users. Of tremendous value to this book are its contributing authors. These authors were specifically chosen for their expertise, passion, and commitment, not only to the field of information science, but also to the professional development of tomorrow's information leaders. I would like to now introduce the panel of authors for this webinar. Marianne Harlan is an assistant professor at San Jose State University School of Information, and she is the coordinator of the Teacher Librarian Program. She has extensive experience in public education, including many years working as a teacher librarian and in middle and high schools. She is the author of chapter six on school libraries. Todd Gilman is librarian for literature in English at Yale University and a part-time instructor in the School of Information at San Jose State University. His book, Academic Librarianship Today, was published in 2017. He is the author of chapter seven, focusing on academic libraries. Pam Smith is the director of Anythink Libraries in Adams County, Colorado north of Denver. Through her leadership, the public library system went from being the worst funded system in the state of Colorado to one of the most recognized library brands worldwide by creating an entirely new service model. She is the 2017-18 Public Library Association president and is a member of the working group for the Aspen Institute Dialogue on Public Libraries. She is author of chapter eight, focusing on public libraries. Michelle Macias is government law librarian with the Department of Justice Libraries. She previously worked as the chief librarian of the civil and criminal division libraries at the Department of Justice. Macias has over 25 years of library experience working in government libraries, including in the executive office of the president, the, the Defense Technical Information Center, and the Department of Interior. She is co-author of Chapter 9 on Special Libraries with Crystal McGaradis, Scott Brown, Jan Knight, and Joyce Fidesco. There are six key themes for the second edition of Information Services Today, an introduction. Chapters six, seven, eight, and nine address four of those key themes. These chapters all provide a state, overall state of the field beginning with the history of the information organization and key influencers to forecasting future trends and issues that will require information professionals to remain forward thinking. They also address how libraries and information centers will remain valuable entities in their communities, but to they will need to remain creative, innovative, and technologically advanced. 
Additionally, they address new competencies, roles, and opportunities for information professionals. And finally, they address challenges and key issues of the field and for the sustainability and essentialness of information organizations. So Mary Ann, Todd, Pam, and Michelle, what is your interpretation of these themes and how do they specifically relate to your chapter's content? Mary Ann, let's start with you. So I think the themes of a, um, about where school libraries are today and the, the ways that they've transitioned are that they're very learner focused. In specific, um, the new AASL standards, which just came out, talk about learners and they talk about learners as a whole, not just the students that enter into our doors, but that they um, are the teachers that we work with and the community that we are a part of. And so it centers itself very much within part of the community. Um, they're also, one of the things I think is happening around school libraries, and I see this across a lot of different library um, or information environments, is the complex nature of literacy. And that, that goes to the nature of being learner focused. Um, the focus is changing to interdisciplinary. And I just put a few of those types of literacies up there as far as information media and uh, information and community technologies literacies. These are um, practices that involve disciplinary literacies from all types of different disciplines and you sort of knowledge structures and um, bases that are part of those. And that's very much a part of the way school libraries are focusing today and the ways they see themselves fitting in to communities. And they really are um, future focused towards building partnerships so that it's not just the school library, um, that, it's, that it's part of a larger community and it's not just the school community, but how we interact with say universities in our area how we uh, work with the public institutions in our areas, uh, how we work with parents and business communities in our area and all of that in terms of trying to build something where we're community centered. And then finally, I think the biggest issue for school libraries is how we provide equity. Thank you very, thank you very much, Marianne. So Todd, what are your thoughts? Hi, in academic libraries, uh, the current trends are uh, an emphasis on information literacy and technology literacy, um, evolving scholarly communications models, um, which, is, which includes uh, digital humanities, uh, otherwise known as DH, open access, um, libraries as publishers, uh, especially libraries um, hosting open access journals. Um, this is motivated by t uh, technological and economic disruptions to the publishing system. There are also new outreach models, uh, which involve embedded librarians. Um, there are new, uh, new roles for librarians, such as research informationists, which are librarians who help scientists conform with data management requirements for federally funded research. Uh, and then scholarly communications librarians who help publish, uh, pub the publishers publish uh, on campus. Um, and then there's a big change in, in uh, philosophy about collections. So the real emphasis now is on access versus ownership uh, because nobody can afford to collect everything. And that has motivated changes such as uh, patron driven acquisitions rather than buying everything in sight uh, in the hope that someone is going to use it. Thank you very much. Pam, what are your thoughts? So I think you're gonna see some similarities of um, the topics that we're talking about. Um, in public libraries, we are moving away um, from collections being the center, I think, to um, really focusing on people and learning. Um, so transactions are really important. Um, we're important, just um, checking books out and keeping our materials um, organized and on the shelf. And today, it's really about the people when they walk in. Um, 21st century public libraries really focus on 21st century skills. Uh, we're still the anchors of our community. And going back um, to our origins with Ben Franklin and the initial um, idea of a sharing library, we were actually doing a, a conversation in the community last year, and I had a, a customer say, or a member of the, the um, the discussion say, I think you're really 
going away from what Ben Franklin originally thought you should do. And I had to chuckle because we're very much um, the center of, of our communities. We're still circulating materials and sharing materials, but we're very much focused on people. Um, we are all about collaboration, communication, critical thinking and creativity, which relates directly to 21st century skills. Uh, our library professionals, our roles are shifting. And the things that we have to be adept at, um, we have to have people skills, um, technology skills, community relationship building skills, partnership. Um, so our, our um, focus is moving outside the library. And we're, I think we're all gonna be talking a little bit about that. And then um, transparency and accountability to our citizens and governance are key. I think that in today's age, we have to be very mindful and people are looking to make sure that we um, are transparent. Um, everything that we do, our transactions are above board and we are held accountable to our communities and we're providing excellent value. And I think that that spotlight probably because of government and governance and things, skepticism happening today, public libraries have to be even, um, even more aware of um, how we appear and, and our communication and relationships with our governance structures. Thank you very much. And Michelle. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, so the key, Three key themes I'm going to talk about are training, competencies, and mission support. And so at the Department of Justice, um, we take two things very, um, we think two things are very important, professional development for our staff and training for those that we support. So I currently head the Workforce Development Committee, and this is a, a committee where we recently worked to review competencies. Um, and we enrolled the staff to help us do that. And now we're teaming with the professional development committee, seeking ways to ensure that we get the training we need. But again, it also comes to serving uh, those that we uh, work with every day because technology is changing so quickly. We have new resources all the time, electronic resources. Being able to teach those skills to our patron base is extremely important. So we develop and deliver training programs and provide instruction on the fly. Um, the other thing I just wanna co cover is mission support. Uh, in federal libraries, one of the things I can speak to is that unlike I think some of the people we've heard from already, uh, it's really important for us to be able to capture the work that we do and convey that story to the people that hold the purse, if you will say. Um, there's been a trend in special federal libraries that we've seen over, oh gosh, I've seen over the course of my 25 years where we are downsizing space, staff, et cetera. And so being able to convey how the work that you do supports the mission so that you can ensure viability and survivability is critical. Thank you very much. Michelle, that's an interesting point. And I think, uh, I think maybe Pam was, alluding to some of that too in terms of some of the transparency and providing value. I think that that's an interesting um, point that you're making. I don't know, Todd and uh, Marianne, did you have anything that you wanted to build on that or, or, Pam, or Pam? I have to say, it's such a part of my thought process in terms of um, having to ensure that we are clear about our value in terms of advocacy because we, depending on the state you live in, there's jobs are um, being lost or have already been lost. But I don't think of it as a trend. I just think of it as something that is realistic and has been since I've been in the profession. So that's interesting that it kind of came out in terms of accountability and transparency, because for me, it's just an automatic, it's just something I've been doing since I went through the program at San Jose State. I would just say that that there, I would, I'd say that there definitely is a, a, a greater emphasis on assessment and accountability, uh, and I'll talk more about that as uh, we go on. Great. Thank you very much. So let's now direct our attention to today's information landscape. 
The first edition of this book came out three years ago. And as we've been talking about, there's been a lot of change in the field and the change in the uh, field of library and information science is constantly happening. So what are some of the key changes as they relate to your chapter's content that have occurred since the first edition came out three years ago? So Marianne, we'll start with you. Um, so, and this might go a little bit to what Todd was just talking about in terms of the increased um, attention on assessment. But I think what there is is um, definitely a much uh, more under, deeper understanding of a need for flexibility and responsiveness to our world. Um, it's impossible to talk about the last year, if not the last three years, in, in terms of information literacy and school libraries and the types of literacies we're teaching about to not talk about media literacy and the emphasis on fake news, but just the ways that social uh, media has impacted the ways the the channels for information and what that means in working, especially with youth. Um, and so there's this flexibility in terms of the types of skills that we're teaching to make sure that they're skills and practices that can respond to what is immediately in front of us. I think um, the issues around equity are incredibly important and I see a lot more focus and issues on these changes. Some just some ideas about um, information deserts and the ways that uh, uh, net neutrality has a potential to impact learning in particular, but certainly um, geographic uh, equity issues. Um, and then there's just these pedagogical trends that are, um, again, swinging back into the center of our focus in education, which would be things around student center learning. Um, this sort of comes out in maker spaces, the DIY movement, all of those things are impacting the ways school libraries deliver services um, and how flexible they are in de um, delivering those services so that they are not um, they're, they're institutions that shift and change as their communities have needs. Thank you, Marianne. So Todd, what are your thoughts? I don't think there's anything new under the sun uh, completely, but I would say that, that, that I have noticed a greater, an ever greater emphasis on service overall. Um, and the way that that is playing itself out is through um, a greater emphasis on the liaison model uh, of, of outreach or out, and that outreach in general has become the sort of buzzword along with, with service that you don't, uh, the idea that you don't sit passively waiting for somebody to approach you about a question, you go out there and you do what you can to encourage people uh, to make use of your, your services. Um, uh, the, so that that's that's the the chief thing. Then the the thing that actually is brand new is the uh, new ACRL framework uh, for information literacy. So getting to the question of information literacy and technology literacy and all the the uh, evolution that is happening there. So there's a greater emphasis um, on active learning rather than passively receiving information, uh, looking at information more critically than in the past. Um, so. Uh, challenging a, an individual's understanding of, of information, not just uh, the librarian standing up there and, and telling them what they need, what they need to know, making them more actively engaged um, to have a deeper understanding of of their um, information environment around them. Uh, there's also an ever ever increasing emphasis on digital humanities, um, which is one of these which is one of the changes to scholarly communications models. Another one is open access. Um, uh, so making things as freely available as possible, uh, publications so that the, the world um, is, has a more equitable uh, 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 access to the products of research. Uh, and then, as I said earlier, libraries uh, taking on the role of publishers in the, in the wake of the devastating financial crisis that has, uh, that has been really uh, decimating the, the academic publishing industry for, for decades. Uh, libraries are taking, are finally, you know, really stepping up to the plate and there are 30% more uh, members of the American Associ Association of American University Presses that are now uh, reporting uh, into libraries um, as, their, as their sort of 
um, their institutional overseer than, than there were even five years ago. And then finally, the idea of collections as a service. So you don't collect, you don't just collect to collect, you collect as a way of meeting the immediate needs of your constituents. That's a new thing. Even in the great libraries, uh, the Harvards, the Yales, uh, and along with that, you have, uh, or, or one example of that is that you have uh, patron-driven acquisition. So, so you don't buy books unless somebody has a need for them. Um, and then also cooperative collection development, the sharing of the burden of collecting across uh, consortial groups, so groups of libraries working together. Thank you, Todd. And Pam? I think public libraries are feeling a lot of pressure to move quickly, um, to make decisions quickly, um, to be um, more entrepreneurial for sure. Um, and something that uh, over the last couple of years, the library as uh, the place of civic discourse, I think is becoming even more important. Um, our forums that um, libraries are hosting where people can come together and have conversations because it's becoming increasingly difficult to have um, civil conversations um, in society today because of um, how discordant things are. And so the library is that safe space where you can come together and explore ideas and talk about things um, in a civil manner. Um, we had a conversation about um, the Vietnam War in conjunction with the ALA Ken Burns um, uh, PBS uh, TV series and we had a moderator and we had um, a room filled with about a hundred people um, most of them are Vietnam vets but also a fair number of people who would have been protesters during the Vietnam War and for, for people to have that opportunity to talk about something that is a national um, wound in a way, and we really haven't talked about things, um, was a way for the library to open doors for people to um, get information in a different way. And in a way that everybody walked away, I think, feeling good about it. We didn't solve anything, but it was an opportunity for people to feel like they were being heard. Uh, for sh definitely the interactive programming is something that is um, so critical to our success today. It's not just good enough to have a program where co people come and listen to somebody. Uh, you come and you actually learn. And so the STEM programming, the STEAM programming, the interactive programming, my illustration is a, a program at the Skokie Public Library in which people are learning how to tie knots. And I think this is something that's an offshoot of um, years and years ago or in another generation, you might learn some of these skills from um, your, your family, your grandparents, your neighbors, and today you're learning those things at the library. So informal learning is, is very important to us. And we concentrate um, more and more on learning in the library. And then lastly, um, community partnerships. Um, we cannot go it alone and we're not the experts. And so bringing in experts um, and talent that we don't necessarily have or um, working on projects um, collaboratively in our community in conjunction with um, other folks at the table, I think is becoming incre incredibly um, important to public libraries and the success. It's not just about the library being successful, but about the library being part of the success of the community. Thank you, Pam. And Michelle. So uh, for today's information landscape, um, if I look at just the past three years and these years uh, and where we're at today, I actually would have a broader view just because three years in government time seems to move rather slowly. <laughs> but uh, one thing that we certainly are faced with is a diminishing budget. And I've heard people say over the the past years, and I think it's true, you can't do more with less. You just have to do what you can with the budget that you have. Um, and we have 
figured out several ways to do that. Uh, one of them is actually uh, has to do with where I'm sitting today. Um, I was a manager on the staff in Washington, D.C. and was re relocating to the Denver area, coming back home after many years in D.C. And because we were on a hiring freeze, one of the ways we solved not being able to replace me was actually to make me a full-time virtual employee. So that's just one of the ways that we've, we've dealt with that. Um, over the past 10 years, our staff has gone from 100 to 60. So you can really see where this is definitely a trend that's impacting us. We still do a great job. Uh, and then back to something I spoke to earlier, ensuring the viability of the library. One of the ways we've done that is we uh, created our own SharePoint reference tracker to track the reference that we do. So we would have information, statistics, uh, the types of questions that we're answering uh, in a way that we can now take that information and make it, uh, it, it, make it uh, into a conversation and, and uh, create reports with it so that we can tell people what it is that we exactly uh, are doing for them. And an increase in electronic resources, I'll speak to that a little bit more in the next slide, but I'll just say that it really has had a big impact in the legal world. Uh, so there's less uh, print that we uh, can, can need to sort of store or warehouse. And then uh, again, speaking to ensuring value for taxpayers, um, we really need to be sure that what we're doing is value. Like, is are we following our mission? Are we doing what we need to do? And are we doing it in the best way that we can with the dollars that we have? Are we organizationally efficient? Thank you, Michelle. It's interesting to hear all of you talk about your different types of changes that have happened in each of the different environments. I was wondering if you had any comments or questions or observations that you would like to make based on what we just were talking about. So I'll jump in. I've heard um, uh, patron-centered um, collection development in academic libraries, and that's something that's critical for public libraries as well and has been for a while, but it's becoming even more important. As you know, it's impossible to collect everything, and so sharing is also important for us and making sure that we um, have our our collections that are focused on the things that are most interesting or most interested in um, our, our particular communities. We have to, we have to focus and narrow our scope. Um, I think that the idea of value um, is something that's critical for public libraries as well. We have to constantly be helping people understand what, um, what our values are and the value that we bring to the community. And it's our responsibility to be articulate about that. Thank you, Pam. I was really struck by that too. I mean, and I think each one of you talked about it in a different way, but it was there in terms of the outreach and the connection with the community that you're serving or that you're working with and that communication of that value, I think um, really came through. Any, uh, uh, Todd, did you want to say something? Yeah, just so just the, so the emphasis on service is 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 a direct um, is a direct uh, result of that because um, you know it, before it was it was okay that you just had this room this building full of stuff and now you have to show people <laughs> all about it and tell them all about it constantly and that because otherwise you're not really demonstrating value. Thank you. Excellent. Well, why don't we move on then? Uh, so now let's direct our attention to the future. What trends or emerging issues will impact the field of library and information science as it relates to your chapter's topic? So thinking to the future, what do you think is going to happen? So Marianne, we'll start with you. Um, I really think that there's this issue of equity, and I know I've mentioned it in the previous two slides, but it's just becoming a much bigger deal, um, particularly in public education. Um, but in general, uh, and uh, recent concerns around um, net neutrality changes have only emphasized this. But as as you see what's happening um, in schools, 
in suburban schools and richer schools, you have one-to-one -one initiatives. Um, you have where you know every student has access to a computer. Um, you have better broadband services. Um, you have libraries that are staffed. Um, whereas if you go into schools in um, poor communities. Do you have understaffed or not staffed libraries? Um, you have old technology, and I think it's a, um, it's a real problem. So this equity sort of issue around underserved communities and underserved schools is a real problem. I think one of the trends that you're gonna start to see is how we build global partnerships um, and how we make the world a little smaller for our students um, by building those global partnerships. And um, one of the things, and I think we saw this in, um, in what was um, being talked about in the last section around um, what's happening in public libraries, it, this idea of doing things, this idea of being able to c complete and practice versus the knowledge that's given to you. Um, I know for sure you see that in the um, ACRL framework for information literacy. Uh, it's starting to, I haven't wrapped my mind yet around the school library standards that just came out in November, but I think you'll see it there as well. So what so that literacy is doing, not just knowing. Thank you, Marianne. Todd, what about you? The real emphasis, the real coming emphases are uh, emphasis uh, in, in terms of new directions, data management uh, in all of its forms, um, uh, uh, especially to do with, with uh, digital uh, resources. Um, there's definitely an e emphasis on um, a student assessment, which I mentioned earlier briefly, uh, to really determine what the outcomes are. That you can't, you can't just. It's not enough just to assess what you have, uh, what you, how how good a teacher you are, but but you have to uh, you have to assess how good the result of that teaching is. Uh, and a new emphasis, therefore, on on pedagogy and the results of pedagogy, recognizing different learning styles. Um, making sure that the that the staff demographic matches the community demographic, so that students feel that they are being uh, talked to by people that they can relate to. Um, um, there's definitely a broadening scope of scholarship at various levels, as we've had to to uh, deal with the retrenchment of resources devoted to scholarship. So uh, different different things counting as scholarship. Uh, we have creation of digital archives now, um, working with big data. Um, uh, and then, like I said before, the library libraries working at becoming publishers. And then finally, on the technical services side of things, uh, we have uh, cha changing description tools uh, and, and increased um, metadata needs, the metadata uh, data about data. Um, so we have new formats. We've left behind the machine readable, uh, the mark record, the, the machine readable cataloging record uh, in favor of things that are that are uh, less uh, cumbersome to use that, that can uh, describe resources, first of all, more expansively, so deal with multiple formats, but also can get uh, books and, and other media into the catalog more quickly. So we've got the RDA, which is, stands for Resource Description and Access, Ferber, which is the functional requirements for bibliographic records to bring let's say every iteration of the, of the title Hamlet together under one record, um, and then other non-MARC uh, uh, metadata schemas. Um, we have evolving, uh, could you, yeah, there you go. Evolving outreach models. Um, we've got embedded librarians going to where the students and faculty are rather than expecting them to come to us. Uh, research informationists that we mentioned, I mentioned before, these are the people who, librarians who help scientists comply with data management requirements given, issued by the federal government in exchange for federal funding for research. Um, changes, uh, changes to pedagogy in terms of our being, um, locating librarians inside course um, shells like in, uh, Canvas. The librarian is now present in, in, in Canvas so that he or she can be where the students are. Um, we have new curatorial activities involving digital preservation. So making sure that we don't lose uh, access to eph ephemeral material, ephem material that is here today and might be gone tomorrow. An analysis of data, archiving web collections that are maybe here today, gone tomorrow. 
and then finally making everybody into a uh, you know cross training people so uh, making positions that are flexible across departments uh, a greater emphasis on computer skills everybody has to be super computer literate these days and um, and therefore also as you might expect more specialized thank you very much Todd Pam what about you so in some ways this might sound like more of the same but community issues really are driving library public library strategy um, we cannot make um, we can't make our strategic decisions um, internally they need to be um, connected with our external factors and um, our projects uh, programs collections are influenced by the needs of our community um, this slide um, my, the image on my slide is uh, a summer um, school um, uh, lunch program that's happening in public libraries or after school um, snacks that we work with local partners to be able to help ensure that the kids in our communities um, have nutrition. Um, you see the libraries uh, working and providing GED programs. Um, um, something that's been prevalent in the last year is the opioid situation in libraries being trained on how to react to that on um, social workers in libraries so that we're better prepared to actually um, connect customers with um, resources in our community. And so each community is different and um, each community makes these decisions based on each library is, makes these decisions based on the needs of the community. In my own community, our Adams County is the eighth fastest growing um, county in the country, and our, our community is asking us to um, be a catalyst for innovation. And so um, that's something that is an awesome ask, um, and it aligns with our own energy and passion and creativity, but that's an unusual ask, I think. Um, and shifting perceptions of the library. I think we still have a very strong brand, um, which is the book brand. However, libraries um, do that and so much more. And so it's our responsibility to help um, our communities understand um, our expanding role and impact in our, um, our um, uh, piece of that um, success measure or quality of life that we're offering and how important we are to um, the success of the community and um, residents wanting to live in a particular community is dependent upon the library but we've got to talk about ourselves in different ways then then lastly um, we're all talking about governance and funding again this goes back to accountability but um, in public libraries, our governance structures are, uh, structures are varied. And um, some, I think we need to really examine um, governance and what type of governance structures could we, um, or do we prosper in? Can we do our best work? Um, and then clearly funding, um, you know, that accountability and value. And I think libraries have to have to work faster and harder. We have to be more innovative and we have to prove our worth over and over again. Thank you very much, Pam. And Michelle, what are your thoughts? So again, it might sound like I'm repeating myself and in some ways I am, but uh, I'm gonna speak to diminishing budgets, a smaller footprint and increase in electronic resources and forecasting future trends. So, and I have covered the topic certainly of diminishing budgets, but Another way that we're working around that uh as far as staffing, um, I've already mentioned my move here, but other ways are having staff who are cross-trained in areas that are maybe outside their area of expertise. So having catalogers who are now working with the web team, having uh, catalogers have a bigger um, contribution to collection development, those kinds of things. Really looking at collections, uh, one of the unique things we do at the Department of Justice is we help our patrons, and by patrons I mean our litigating division, so our civil division, criminal rights, etc. They have a large uh, budget for publications that they keep in their division sections. And so we, through a um, 
arrangement will purchase those um, publications on their behalf. But when we do that, we're also saying to them and educating them, hey, look, you've got this particular item, but this is available in these different electronic resources and in the library and et cetera. So it's trying to help not only the library with their diminishing budget, but the entire department with diminishing budgets. A smaller footprint, um, certainly at the department, we have, like most government employees, have been asked to downsize and we're currently doing that. Um, and an, another way that um, we can deal with that is just making sure that the money that we're spending for the resources we have really are what we need. And uh, we are somewhat turning to that model of just in time, but for us, it's a little bit harder with legal resources to do that. Um, but we're we're finding ways that, that we can do it within uh, what resources we have available to us. And by that, I mean just a, a lot of uh, the money and uh, resources to do things like eBooks. Even an eBook is a big challenge in our uh, technology environment. Uh, so that along with the increase um, of electronic resources, it, it we have been able to move away from large, large print collections of legal resources that take up a lot of space uh, into smaller uh, footprint. And then I think forecasting future trends is something that one can't necessarily just do, but it, it's a skill that you learn through um, a lot of different ways. If you've got a staff, for example, we have an emerging technologies committee, and we, we look at the different types of technologies that are out there and we try to figure out what we can use within the confines of our organization because we have challenges like security. We have challenges of the budget. We have uh, challenges of being an organization with over 100,000 people and how do you manage uh, implementing any new technologies. And if you're the only uh, entity within an organization that large that actually has access to everybody in the department because everybody else is siloed in these old uh, sort of uh, organizational ways of being, but yet that really can't change. How do you uh, try to implement some of those um, future trends uh, and, and do so while understanding that there's just only so much you can do? But try and be creative to do that. Thank you. So you've all outlined some really interesting future challenges and opportunities for the field. Um, I wanted to open it up to you to see if you, there was anything more that any of you wanted to add or build on. Uh, if you heard something that made you think of something that somebody else said, I'd like to open it up. I just wanted to comment on something Pam said um, in terms of something we've all said, which she talked about having a strong book brand, but that we do so much more. And I thought that was a really interesting way of phrasing this because we're talking about what our trends are and future watching. And we've talked, Todd talked about providing services, like it's not just enough to have a building anymore. You have to teach people how to use them. And Michelle just talked about that with electronic resources. And certainly I've been learner focused. And yet there is this sort of traditional branding that um, at least three of our information, but I think all of our information environments have, and this idea of like, not losing that while being future focused and thinking about how to bring those ideas together is I think a really important thing that we need to struggle with within our, discipline. our discipline. Yeah, I, I, I would add um, that, that the this, uh, two of us talked about cross training, and I think that that, that speaks to um, a diminishing emphasis on, on staff um, from, from the past. Um, we're going to see a lot, uh, many fewer paraprofessional positions, I think, in libraries uh, because so much of the work has be become more efficient and automated. Um, so, uh, and I'll talk about that in my next section too, about just, just how to be competitive <laughs> and make sure that there's a job for you. Great, Great. Thank, thank you. you. So something that I, I often say is merging innovation with tradition is that we have this rich, wonderful um, place in our culture, um, which started as a book culture, and now it doesn't necessarily need to be format-based, um, and, and, we, and we're expanding on, on that. So all of us are innovating, but all of us are anchored to our origins and our traditions. 
thank you. Great. Well, let's move on. So now we've addressed the changes of the past few years and some of the challenges and opportunities that lie ahead. But at the core of the information landscape are the people who work in these organizations, providing services to the, the communities that they serve, which leads us to focus on today's information professional. So what advice do you have for the new information professional to meet the needs of tomorrow's information landscape? And based on your area of expertise, what are some of the key competencies information professionals will need to, need to succeed in meeting the needs of their communities and organizations that they serve? So Marianne, we'll start with you. Um, so I think the, the key thing is being a master learner. Um, and by that, I just mean that you're always learning. You're always looking at the ways that people learn and how that shifts and what that, um, you know, how to, so that you're always a part of that. Uh, and I will say, um, I always say that being a school librarian hasn't changed that much since when I entered the field 20 years ago, but some of that is because I entered the field with this idea that I was a learner first. And there are a lot of things that have shifted and you have to continue to be learning. So if you're gonna stay on top of the trends and be future thinking and see how things are changing, that's really, really important that that is the way you see your position in the world. Um, the second is, is that you have to be information literate. Um, I actually prefer the ACRL frameworks, uh, I think, to what I see out of um, the, the K-12 framework for information literacy now. They don't even use the word information literate. But I, it's really important to understand um, information, to be an information scientist, to understand how it's created and how it's circulated and how we experience it, because that will help you be a master learner. And to me, that's what's really important. And just really finally, I do honestly think that being a school librarian is the best job in the school building. So if you're that, if you, if you get that job, you should enjoy it because it's really fun. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Marianne. So Todd, what do you think? I'd just like to emphasize uh, three, three um, sort of um, qualities that you should have uh, for the, to be fully prepared, fully armed for the future. Uh, further your education, get trained in pedagogy, and uh, work with the digital world, digital collections. So going back to furthering your education, in the academic libraries, uh, there are fewer and fewer positions now um, than, than ever before. This lack of emphasis on staff, um, but there are still positions and they're very good ones. Uh, to be most competitive for them, you should um, you should try and get an additional master's degree. I think that I've been pushing that for over a decade and I think it's, it's still really important. Um, uh, recognize that the MLS programs, as, as good as they are, have way too much that they have to cover for all the different uh, information environments that, 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 that their students are going into. So you, you, know, you cannot just assume that you will learn everything you need to know in your, in your MLS program. You have to continue to educate yourself in any way you can. Um, and just recognize that there's just greater competition than ever before for, for fewer positions than ever before. Second, get trained in pedagogy. Pedagogy, learning to teach and practice teaching is, is, is what we will be called upon more than anything else. Um, when everything else becomes automated, as it eventually will, the, the, the human factor will still matter in the sense of our ability to reach students through, um, through our uh, web interfaces and, and through our personal interactions. And that all happens through instruction in pedagogy. So get some training in instructional design uh, get some practical teaching experience if you can. Um, and then finally, digital collections are, are what's the future. Um, we're going to, we, while we're still collecting books, we have to, um, we, and we will continue to collect books, the digital world is taking over. So um, learn about metadata, data curation, um, digital preservation, web archiving, learn about open access, learn about copyright, learn about intellectual property. Thank you very much, Todd. 
Pam, what are your thoughts? So uh, public librarians, our roles are evolving into, an, and at my library, we call our librarians guides because our relationship with our customers is um, to help people along their quest to understand where they want to go, um, what adventure they're taking, what skill they want to learn, and then we walk side by side to help them um, find their path or the information that they're looking for. And so um, we expect, again, at my library for people to be wizard genius and explorers, um, which is very high expectations um, to try to live up to. Uh, our, our competencies as we move into the future, and I think it's actually here, is that we need to be connectors. Um, we need to be relationship builders. And so um, the personality skills, the affective skills um, are even more critical today than, than they've ever been. Um, Professor um, John McKnight um, talks about libraries and the, uh, he talks about libraries role in the abundant community and the library's ability to make those connections in our community so that um, people find each other or people find the, um, not only the information, but the people who have the information in our community. So we're those connectors. Um, collaborators, um, again, our world is a place where you have to work in a team environment. And so in order to be successful, we have to um, learn how to be a team player, both in our community and within our own um, library system so that we can bring out the very best in our, in our teams. Um, curious and continuous learner. Um, you've got to, just as Marianne said, we've got to always be learning. And um, as leaders in the profession, um, we've got to model that learning. Um, when we hire people, um, we look for people who have that natural curiosity because I think that creates that sense of um, that endless quest for always, um, always having an, uh, an interesting life and um, to create that spark in the community and to create that sense of possibility within our community as well. Thank you very much, Pam. So Michelle, what do you think? So, yeah, I think we can all agree a love of learning. <laughs> um, similar to Mary Ann, I entered this profession just because um, I, I have always loved learning and I'm still learning today. So embrace that. Uh, one thing I heard today and I, I liked uh, or I, I actually read this on a blog um, was the terms reskilling and upskilling, which I thought was an interesting way to describe uh, ways that both organizations need to make sure they're viable, right? So they need to make sure that they're helping their employees do that. And also as a librarian or really in any field, it's just so important to, to continue to learn. Uh, the other thing is professional development. I can't speak enough about professional associations and just what they can do for your career. Um, it's a place where you may not be able to get the skills that you're getting that you want to get you know, on the job, but it's a place where you can certainly get them um, outside of uh, your job, but yet still within the profession. Um, and certainly reading library literature, but also I encourage people to read a wide variety of literature because you may have a discipline that, for example, for me, it's as a law librarian, but, you know, reading um, when it comes to sciences and uh, medicine and anything I can get my hands on that somewhat interests me, the environment outside of what I'm already know um, is really, uh, I think, important and it helps bring value not only to your uh, knowledge and what the knowledge you have, but also to your to your environment where you work in some way. Um, and then I think obviously blogs are another way. And I can't say enough for just being flexible because life is changing so quickly now. We've got to be able to, to, to bend a little bit and compromise and be willing to change. And then one thing um, I'd like to point out is um, as somebody who's been a manager and been in a hiring position, I, I can't say enough for an enthusiasm for the profession, you know, being enthusiastic about what you do is really important. Um, 
it conveys a lot of different things. And then for me, uh, the professional competencies that I see are communication. Um, as Pam mentioned, you have to work in teams and everything we do uh, at the Department of Justice Libraries really is in a team environment unless we are answering a question one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, so to be able to communicate well, not only with the people you work with, but with people throughout the organization who may not have the same language as you um, and uh, to be able to, to figure out how you can communicate with them and you know being really patient about it too and maybe you need to learn a different way to communicate. Obviously reference and research um, that's a, a large part of uh, my job and a actually the biggest part of what we do for the litigating divisions at the department. And collection development, again, it's traditional, but it's changing in so many ways. Um, and just being able to continually learn about the new resources that are out there, uh, being able to see what resources are important to your clients and what you'll need um, to be sure that you can give them what they need. Training and outreach, I can't say enough for it. We teach classes on legislative history, on uh, some of the work we do, like finding experts, researching experts, vetting expert that, experts, that kind of thing. But also uh, developing training that really focuses for certain sectors of your population that you serve. Outreach, we have a marketing team. I mean, it's critical to, to reach the people that, you know, for us, again, you heard me mention earlier, we're sort of siloed. We don't see each other, all 100,000 of us, and we don't all come to the library. So how do we make sure that we're getting to the people that, you know, are out there uh, through our outreach? And the management of web and internet content, um, I can't speak enough to it. Uh, we have a large virtual library presence uh, that, you know, has been developed like most libraries over the past, uh, you know, 20 years. But, you know, that content, it's a big part of our job managing that and making sure that when people come to our website, uh, because they are all out throughout the, the U.S. and people abroad, that they can get what they need somewhat um, and maybe in some ways more than somewhat from our virtual library and then the impact of technology I mean obviously it's it's just huge and being sure that you understand technology you implement it as much as you can in your everyday life um, and just integrate those tools as best you can and then uh, just touching on copyright just understanding those laws um, and how they relate to your work in your your organization because they can be different depending on where you're at thank you michelle so you've thank all you. raised a lot of interesting points and in, about competencies that people need to be prepared for one thing i was struck by uh, and this i think all of you touched on this a little bit was related to a lot of soft skill type um, type of competencies, uh, you know, being a good communicator, being a good relationship builder, being uh, flexible, being enthusiastic. I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how you envision people being able to develop those or cultivate some of those kinds of skills and, and be able to demonstrate that. I can answer that. I think one way that if, if you're a new librarian in the field, you can do it is by uh, t taking small steps. Like if you've got a, a team at work that's uh, coming together for a specific task, like uh, developing a succession plan or marketing, I think um, that that's a good safe place to, to start one, figuring out how you're going to be as a team member, and then two, taking on leading a team. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with personal interest too though. Uh, you, you, you really need to be able to explore what that means to you. So if that's reading, if that's taking classes, um, if that's trying out different ways of being in the, in the workplace and communicating, um, of course be a little bit careful there in the workplace, but um, I think having an interest is, is really important because it is just a skill that we're all going to, to need. And we've always needed it, but it's become even more important because we're communicating in so many different ways too. We're not just talking to each other. We're IMing, we're emailing, you know, we're 
uh, uh, working in closer proximity with each other. Um, and so, yeah, I'll stop there. I would like to uh, just add that uh, I've been involved in an initiative um, with a group of um, uh, librarian peers and a and a consultancy to try and define what will make the uh, librarian of the future of say 2023 the academic librarian um, involved in teaching and, and learning and what we're trying to do as a result of our efforts is to come up with a tool that can be used a self-assessment tool that can be used um, that can be administered to employees but that can also um, that that employees can have their their supervisors um, use to assess them. So it's sort of the, the, that kind of 360 uh, evaluation. So you 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 assess yourself. Do I have these competencies? Am I friendly? Am I you know? Am I responsive? Am I a good communicator? And you assess yourself, and then your maybe your supervisor assesses you and says, oh, you know, well, you were right about this, but in my opinion, you, this could this could use some work. Um, you're even better at this than you thought. This other thing, and that sort of thing. It's interesting that you brought the self-assessment up because I was going to say one of the things I think is really important is reflection on your skills and strengths and weaknesses and how those play out. And um, I was thinking along the lines of developing relationships with mentors to help you with that self-assessment or reflection. And I, um, that's a really important way, I think, that you develop those skills um, as you're working through and, and becoming a stronger um, professional. I think that um, hospitality is a word that we don't use in libraries often enough, but I think paying attention to hospitality and how we make people feel. So we don't talk about feelings or when people walk into our library, that sense of ambiance, but I think how we make people feel and how we support each other in developing hospitality skills, which is one of warmth. and. Um, that's something I think that working as a team and celebrating um, when you um, create that environment and when one of your colleagues actually hits it out of the park when you have a particularly difficult situation. But um, I think hospitality and warmth and feeling is really important for us to think about as a profession. Thank you very much. So I'd like to thank Marianne Harlan, Todd Gilman, Pam Smith, and Michelle Macias for joining us today in this webinar on today's information profession. I'm very grateful that you have participated and shared the advice that you did in this webinar and also made the contribution to the book Information Services Today and Introduction. Um, to the listener, I'd like to thank you for joining us and I hope that you gained a deeper understanding of some of the changes and challenges and opportunities that are within the field of library and information science today. For more information, please also check out the online supplement of additional materials. There's a lot of additional information there. And I'd like to thank you all again.